Thank you. Okay, welcome back. Uh, I hope you had fun with that activity. Uh, I put the key up for the activity uh, today. And so you can go and see with that. I, I downloaded your responses as well and I'll grade those uh, this week sometime. On uh, the schedule for this week, we were gonna continue on with 2D NMR. But what I wanna do is do one more activity on Thursday for 2D NMR, but I wanna introduce other nuclei, okay? The other thing that I'm gonna to add to the syllabus that wasn't there before is I wanna do a couple things on one whole lecture and one activity on uh, UV-Vis spectroscopy. Um, my wife was telling me that yes, they removed it from the book as a chapter, but a lot of people use it like, uh, like Marvin and Emma will be using it in their research to look for conjugation. And they're used a lot in, in, in biochemistry to look for a lot of different things there. So I'm going to include a chapter, uh, a, a set of slides and an activity on UV vis spectroscopy as well. Okay. And then uh, I'll, I'll probably have that for next week. And then we'll have one last activity and then we'll be prepared for the test. Okay. So I'm sorry I changed things. I don't like to change things there, but um, it looked like that was a good thing to do. So I have downloaded the UV uh, spectroscopy uh, chapter that they removed from the book and I've uploaded it to Canvas. So both the uh, 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 433 and 533, uh, uh, both spec classes should be able to find that on Canvas under files. It's called uh, Chapter 5, 7A. Uh, our current Chapter 7 is Solved Problems, and we'll start doing that as well. However, this is 7A, which is UV vis spectroscopy, and I'll make some slides based on that, and I'll talk about that next. Okay. So, any questions about administration up to this point? No, no. Okay, great. All right, let me go ahead and start sharing my screen and let's talk about some other nuclei available to us. Okay, so as we know, um, one of the requirements for us to have um, an NMR active material is we need to have a spin of one half. And that spin of one half allows us to pulse it and watch it go from spin aligned to unaligned and allows us to see that signal, okay? But, and the most, the easiest way to figure this out is if you have an odd molecular number or, and or an odd molecular weight, you will tend to have a mismatch between protons and neutrons and you'll end up with that half spin, okay? So in addition to spin, we have to start thinking about one other thing, which is the quadrupole of the nuclei. So the quadrupole of the nuclei, if you have a half a spin, your quadrupole is by definition zero, okay? But a quadrupole of greater or lesser than zero, like if you have a spin of zero or a spin of one or a spin of two, one of those integers, you tend to have a quadrupole that's above or below zero. If it's above or below zero, that runs into problems with our NMR. But let's start talking about, you know, the nuclei we know and love, which is hydrogen, of course. We really like it because the primary um, isotope that we can see is our half spin. It has a very good susceptibility. It's got a very good frequency. And we use that extensively in most of our NMR up to now. Uh, if we looked at the uh, deuterium NMR, turns out it has a spin of one. And we can technically see it, but it'll have broad lines. It doesn't have broad lines because it does not have a zero quadrupole. The quadrupole is about 0 0.038. So we can actually see it in NMR. However, because the quadrupole, which means the nucleus is actually not spherical anymore, it has a distortion to it. Because that distortion can align with the magnetic field or not align with the magnetic field, it broadens out our signals. Okay. Carbon-12 actually has zero spin and zero quadrupole, so we don't see it at all. Uh, Carbon-13 has our great half spin, and but even though it has a low natural occurrence, its susceptibility is good enough that we can get clean NMR spectrum. Now, the next two most important things, which are along that second row of the periodic table, are nitrogen and oxygen, okay? 
So nitrogen-14, obviously an even number, means it's going to have a, um, a, a, a spin of one, and therefore we don't see it very well in the NMR, although we can see it. But it has a quadrupole of one, which means no matter how much you try to uh, play with the uh, frequency uh, bandwidth, what you're going to end up with broad strokes, broad peaks. But it is the most common isotope. Okay, so it is technically useful because it has more than a zero uh, um, spin, but it has a quad uh, quadrupole moment, and that quadrupole moment makes it difficult to use. And I'll show you some examples of what we mean by having a quadrupole and not. Okay. Then when we get to uh, oxygen 16, we have no NMR signal because we have zero spin. But oxygen 17, which is a very small isotope, has five half spin, okay? So technically we can see it by NMR. However, it does have a quadrupole moment and that quadrupole moment broadens the lines out quite a bit. Okay, so let's take them one by one. I'm only gonna do nitrogen and, uh, and because that's the one most useful because it does have a zero quadrupole and a half spin in one of its isotopes. So in nitrogen 15, we have a mismatch between, we have one extra pro, uh, neutron, that one extra neutron gives us our half spin and we have a natural abundance about 0.4%. Now remember carbon's a little higher at 1.1%. However, it actually has an interesting amount of, uh, even though it has a low uh, abundance, it has a low frequency, which makes it a little bit uh, harder to see because the, the higher the field of the magnet you have, the greater the frequency difference, and we can actually see those different uh, signals as well. But even though it has such a low uh, atomic abundance of point point, it actually has a decent susceptibility. So we get a decent signal to noise ratio. There's messier than proton NMR, but we can see and differentiate different nitrogens with and without hydrogens on them. Okay, so let me go back and talk about uh, nuclear quadrupole moment, okay? In our substrates with half spin, our quadrupole moment makes it zero, which makes the nucleus magnetically spherical, okay? It's completely spherical, and therefore, in a magnetic field, we do not see a distortion from the fact that it is not spherical. So if you had a, um, a, a quadrupole moment that was greater than zero uh, in a positive number, you'll actually have the distortion aligned with the magnetic field. And if you have that quantum uh, quadrupole, I'm sorry, that nuclear quadrupole that was less than zero, meaning a negative number, you actually are orthogonal to the, uh, to the magnetic field, both of which, just both of those distortions cause line broadening and makes it difficult to pick out your peaks. Okay. So, when we're looking for a great nucleus, we're looking for something with a half spin or multiple half spins and a quadrupole moment of zero. Those are going to give us our cleanest lines and those are going to give us our most useful NMR active species. Okay, so let's go back to nitrogen here. Um, so in our uh, system, because we have a one, uh, we have a, a, a spin of, I'm sorry, we have a, a, a integer of one for nitrogen. We can see it. However, it gives us those broad lines because of that quadrupole moment. The 15 gives us sharp lines and we can use that more. So what does this look like, okay? So this is actually an NMR spectrum of urea. We have one type of nitrogen here and notice there's hydrogen on there. And in this case, we actually have decoupled the hydrogens to get a single signal, okay? so. If we look at the top line here, the broad line here, that's the N14. That's the one with the uh, non-zero uh, quadrupole moment. And notice it's broadened out. But also notice that the broadness covers 150 ppm, okay? So 150 ppm at a 300 megahertz NMR is like 1,000 or more, uh, 10,000 or more hertz. So we're talking your line is really, really broad. However, if we look at the N15, and notice the signal to noise ratio on that N15. We have a, it's very similar to that of carbon, and we have a single peak for that nitrogen. And again, we've decoupled the hydrogen out of it, so we get that single peak, just like we see in carbon. And 
Notice it's not as clean as a proton LMR because the amount of material there is quite low, 0.4% natural abundance. But we still get a signal from this thing. And so this shows you the um, importance of having a zero quadrupole on your nucleus because it allows you to get these nice, clean, sharp peaks. Okay. Can I ask a question? Why nitrogen only have a quadrupole moment? Why does the nitrogen 14 have the quadrupole moment? Why only nitrogen have the quadrupole moment? No, no, all, all, um, you have to measure them for all nuclei. It's just nitrogen okay. 14 has a positive quadrupole moment, but nitrogen 15, because it has half spin, has zero quadrupole moment. Things with half spin end up with zero quadrupole moments. Okay, so that's one of the great things about, you know, those are the things we look for in uh, a, an NMR active species is having an un, uh, a, a one half spin or a multiple of one half spin. Because all of our one half spin and multiples of one half spin have zero quadrupole moments. Okay. So in this particular case, what we were able to, what they actually did was they took this very complex uh, a polypeptide uh, and they were able to look at using a nitrogen hydrogen correlation. Okay. So what they're looking for here is they're looking for hydrogens that are actually bound directly to the nitrogen. Okay. So if you look at the ones that have hydrogens bound directly to the hydrogen, you can pick out all of the ones that are the secondary amines are amides, okay? And the other signals are the ones with longer range correlations or ones without a direct hydrogen bond, which means that those are the nitrogens associated with our uh, tertiary amides and amines in the system. So we can differentiate between a secondary and a tertiary here using this kind of couple decouple method in our N4, N15 NMR system. Is that typical of uh, nitrogen 15 NMR that you are really observing its um, correlation with hydrogens every time or is that a special kind of NMR? Well, I mean, again, when we do uh, our carbon NMR, we decouple the hydrogen with it using a pull sequence. Every spin active nuclei will interact with every other spin active nuclei. And I have a slide about that later, okay? So for example, we did that thing where fluorine was actually coupling to hydrogen, right? You saw it coupling not only through a sing not only through two bonds, but through multiple bonds because that coupling constant got pretty big, okay? And we're gonna see that with every spin active nucleus. If you are not decoupling it with a decoupling pulse sequence, you will see most of the time it's direct uh, single bond, but you can get double bond, two bonds, three bonds, and four bond connections. And you can see them if you don't suppress the uh, other nuclei coupling it. Okay. And I'll show you that several examples of where the nuclei are coupling together. Okay. So, and then this also helps us to identify some really interesting things about a molecule. You know, if you just did your Lewis dot structure of an azide molecule, you'd see that number one, it has a net charge of negative one, but the formal charge on the nitrogen in the middle is actually plus and the two on the ends are negative. Now you could say, well, that's kind of just a theory. It's kind of just a, a, a Lewis dot structure that makes sense. But when we analyze the azide, and, uh, the azide ion by NMR, we actually only see two types of nitrogen. So again, those positions are types of nitrogen, which means those two negatively charged nitrogen are magnetically equivalent, or so they're chemically equivalent, okay? So um, when we can see that in, so this actually becomes really important when you have rings, uh, air, uh, heteroaromatic rings. You can see if nitrogens on two sides of your ring are chemically equivalent or not chemically equivalent by looking at their shifts in, pro, in your uh, nitrogen NMR. Now notice the noisy baseline again, because our 
a low natural abundance of 0.4%. So now I said in that last one, we actually were able to decouple the, um, the hydrogens from the system. And so what we can also see is that in this case here, phosphorus is also a spin active element, okay? And our phosphorus can couple through two bonds to nitrogen. So in this case here, we can actually see the location of a nitrogen next to two uh, phosphate esters, okay? And it's two bonds away, okay? And in this case here, the nitrogen here is coupled to those two phosphorus, those two are spin active. So our N plus one still works. We get one peak for our N and the two phosphoruses are actually splitting our nitrogen peak, okay? So this is the case that kind of answers your question, Elena, is that if it is a spin active and you do not use an experiment to decouple, you will see the coupling and you get that same type of equivalency splitting we see, okay? So in this particular case, our, um, you have to blow this peak up at the end really, really big to be able to see it. But what you do see is that it has a coupling constant of about 6.9%. And that's the coupling constant between the nitrogen and the phosphorus, because they're both staying active. We've decoupled the hydrogen in this particular one. Um, so, and because of that, we can actually tell the difference between this diphosphate ester right here and then if you to, were to take off one of those methyl groups and put a third phosphate on here, you actually end up seeing that you get a second coupling constant, okay? The first coupling constant is two bonds over and is similar to the coupling constant we see for the two bonds over, but the, we also have an additional one bond coupling constant. Notice the one bond coupling constant right here is much, much higher. The closer you are to that single bond, the higher the coupling constant you always have, and then it kind of fades as you go out for more connections, okay? Now think about that. We don't really see carbon-carbon couplings because carbon-13 next to carbon-13 is very rare, okay? When, and we don't usually have two hydrogens together, so we don't see that coupling constant. But geminal hydrogens have a different coupling constant than the three bond over coupling constant, okay? And so we see that also in our other active nuclei, we can tell the difference between adjacent single bond uh, spin coupled nuclei and double two bond spin coupled nuclei. By the time you get out to your third bond, the, the coupling uh, splitting is less than one Hertz. And so we don't see actually a three bond phosphorus nitrogen coupling. Okay. Now notice this experiment took a long time because our delay time was 15 seconds. Okay, and this particular was inverse gated. So we had to get rid of the hydrogen connections and we were looking for that second spin couple with the phosphorus. So, so another effect of the quadrupole is that it actually broadens your lines and it changes the number of lines you get. So you end up with actually uh, two N plus one lines. And when you end up with two N plus one lines and you are uh, having a very slow relaxation, you end up getting the sum of all of those peaks. The longer you wait for signal, because you have such a low amount of signal anyway, the longer you wait for signal, the more you're blending all of the different couplings together. So if we looked at and we gated it for just a one second, we would see a fairly narrow peak. And then as that relaxed out, we'd start to see a coupling with the adjacent hydrogen. And then adjacent hydrogen coupling would have a certain uh, coupling constant J. But the signal we see because of the quadrupole is actually the blending of all of these uh, relaxation times giving us those broad peaks. However, if we wait, for a very long time, basically cut off the first, you know, 10 seconds of the FID, we can actually end up getting our perfect um, uh, 2N plus one, okay? So we have one hydrogen directly attached to that nitrogen and then two carbons attached to it. And we are seeing that that one hydrogen 
in that one bond because of the fact that we have the nitrogen 14 and it has a quadrupole is actually doubling the number of peaks we see with the directly attached nuclei. So we're actually seeing a spin coupling with a half spin nitrogen, half spin hydrogen and the one spin uh, nitrogen with the quadrupole nuclei. And so really, I mean, this, this, if you took it, any one of these little segments here, you'll see that if you add them all together, you're starting to get these really, really broad signals and how it doesn't really, it's very difficult to use this uh, unless you're looking at very specific small molecules. So in our proton NMR, we have, you know, shifts are typically zero to 10 ppm. You can get some stuff out, maybe 15, right? In carbon NMR, most of the time we shift from zero to maybe 220 if we have a, like a carbon, an aldehyde or a ketone, right? Well, nitrogen, the shift is actually a little bit larger. We actually have about a thousand ppm shift, okay? And so that correlates to a very wide uh, frequency domain at which we have to pulse with and a very big shift difference in what we have. And so starting from things that look most like our TMS. So if we think about uh, the silicon uh, tetramethyl silane, right? We always put that down at the zero mark for proton and carbon, right? Well, in the nitrogen system, it is actually shifted very downfield. It's at the negative 400 range for us. And then as we gain things like uh, less electronegative atoms, we start moving over and over until we get to what we consider our, our zero range. And those tend to be things like, um, you know, uh, air, aromatic heterocycles. Aromatic heterocycles brings us up into the zero range. And then as we go to stronger and stronger, more nitro, more acidic like uh, proton, uh, nitrogens, we start seeing it shift further and further over. So if you look down here, we got nitroso and thionitroso and nitroxides being at the highest end of the spectrum, okay? Obviously, you don't have to remember any of these. I just want to show you that we have a really big shift. And when, if you're using this technique in your research, you have to go figure out exactly kind of the range you're looking for, because you might just plot, you know, zero to 100 and not see anything. So you have to go back and make sure that you're, number one, doing the correct scan with, because we're looking at, you know, uh, you know, megahertz wider scan width than you have with your hydrogen or your carbon. Okay. So, oh. so it, uh, so, and I'm not sure about RNMR, but I think RNMR now has computer controls that you can tune to almost all half spin nuclei. Uh, that's the last thing I heard. So you can do boron, you can do fluorine, you can do silicon, you can do nitrogen 15. Uh, I'd ha I'll have to double check that, but I think you, the, all of these are available to your research if you do have uh, an ambiguous assignment in your research. Okay. So again, that's the other reason to do these alternate nuclei is if you have something that's ambiguous, you know, you ran your proton and carbon and you're not quite sure and we, in our activity, we were able to tell the difference between two carbons based on our um, knowing that in, in the ring we had, it was the three and four positions. You didn't know which one was closer to the, uh, the ether-like carbon or which was most closer to the carbonyl carbon. But our head court, uh, you know, our, 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 our cozy told us that. Our cozy was definitely saying, oh, this one is definitely this one. This is definitely three and this is definitely four. So we can use those additional assignments for nitrogens as well if you have a multi-nitrogen system. Okay, now this is one of my favorite non-proton carbon nuclei. And it's because it's 100% a natural abundance. It's got a half spin, it has a zero quadrupole. It is really good. And it has a very wide chemical shift and they give very clean NMR. And most of them, most of them are integratable because of the cleanliness of this thing. So you can actually say, ah, oh, I have six uh, fluorines on this, uh, on this benzene ring and three fluorines on this methyl group. You can definitely see that kind of stuff, okay? So 
Uh, there's a bunch of different things used for reference standards. For me, I prefer to use uh, hexafluorobenzene. Hexafluorobenzene show is our is our one of our let me get this off now. Uh, is actually easier to use than the fluorotrichloromethane. Fluorotrichloromethane has a very low boiling point. And is, it, it goes away very quickly. And so in the lab, it's much easier to use hexafluorobenzene. You just have to account for it being at the 164.9 hertz away from the quote standard, which is the fluorotrichloromethane. Okay. But there's a lot of other ones you can use. Uh, some are more or less toxic. Uh, hexafluorobenzene is fairly low toxicity and it boils at like 100 degrees. So it's really nice and stable. It's kind of like the TMS of fluorine and amide. Okay. Now, you'll notice that even these standards have very wide PPM ranges. We have minus like 200 to plus 400. Well, the range is actually a little bit wider than that. It goes actually pretty close to about 1500 ppm, okay? And so the differences come in the fact that you are below zero on this as you move to things that are aromatic, things that have sp3 hybridized carbons tend to be shifted sub zero on our scale here. And then things that are above zero are things that are more where you have like a heavy atom, a, a longer fluorine uh, metal bond. For example, uh, xenon tetrafluoride, fluorine itself, xenon difluoride, uh, trifluoro uh, nitrogen, forgot what that's called, it's explosive there. HF, those are the ones that we see above zero degrees. So if you have a halogenated hydrocarbon, what you're going to see is your shifts are going to be definitely below zero on the PPM scale for the system, which is another reason I actually like to use uh, the hexafluorobenzene because that puts you right in the scale. And so you're really, oops, that puts you right in the middle of the band where you're going to see those fluorocarbons. And so that makes it easier for me to do. So, but notice that we go from, you know, it, it actually gets a little bit wider than this. There are some things outside of this range. You know. Okay. So like I said before, is that any spin active uh, compound will split any other spin active compound if you do not decouple it. And again, it's fairly easy to decouple it because you would be pulsing with a slightly different frequency uh, when you have your hydrogen actually is, is pulsed at a different frequency than your fluorine, which is pulsed at a different frequency than your carbon. So you can continue to pulse with the decoupling frequency while you're listening to the FID for the nuclei of, that you're choosing. And as we looked at before, fluorine actually has a great single uh, a two bond coupling and they're fairly large. 50 to 100 is not uncommon for a, a two bond coupling. For a three bond coupling, it gets about half that, usually in the 20 to 25 uh, ppm range. But fluorine is such a um, strong nuclei, we actually can see a four bond coupling. And in this case, we see a four bond fluorine hydrogen coupling at about four hertz in our system. And so, so let's look at this fluoroacetone. Let me blow it up a little bit here. So we have four equivalent hydrogens. Oops, off again. We have these two hydrogens here are equivalent. And so we should see a JFH two bond coupling constant for those hydrogens. Now there are no hydrogens on our third, on, on our, our second carbon over. So there are no uh, three bond hydrogens here. So we don't see that coupling, but we do have these non-equivalent hydrogens over here. And we have a total of one, two, three, four bonds to these hydrogen here. And so we have a coupling constant with four bonds that F to H it turns it out to be about 3.4 Hertz. And notice these are very nice clean lines, the kind of lines you'd expect to see in our uh, proton NMR. Now notice that the, the hydrogens are not splitting. We see splitting in, uh, in uh, different systems, but in this case, we see the fluorine only being split by the type of hydrogen, not the number of, I'm sorry, the hydrogen, yeah. The hydrogens are being split by the fluorine, sorry, backwards. 
the hydrogens are being split by the fluorine and there's only one fluorine. So it's only being split once. So it's following the N plus one rule. And the N in this case is the number of fluorines. So that's why they're only in doublets here, but that's why our coupling constants, this is the one that is our two bond coupling constant and this is our four bond. So notice this is the proton NMR right here. And so we're seeing the fluorine coupling with the hydrogens in the proton NMR. Okay. And because fluorine is spin active and carbon is spin active, we can actually see couplings there as well. Okay. Uh, they tend to be only that one bond coupling but you can see two bond couplings. One bond couplings are very big. We see about uh, 100 and 200 to 100, uh, 185 hertz is pretty common. Uh, once you get to two bond coupling, it gets a little lower. So that means a fluorine bonded directly to a carbon can have a coupling constant, a uh, coupling which means it'll split that and by about 185 hertz. And if we look at that on the PPM scale here, it actually turns out to be quite significant. It's almost 10 uh, ppm difference between them right here. And this is another way to tell if the fluorine is bound directly to your carbon or not, because the fluorine is splitting the carbon NMR. We're looking at the carbon NMR. So if you have a fluorohydrocarbon and you're not specifically decoupling your fluorine from it by pulsing that fluorine uh, uh, frequency, you can actually come up with more peaks than you thought you had. When you come up with more peaks than you thought you had, you have to figure out why. And so in this case here, this is our, our J1 peak right here. And that gives rise to this one here. And then notice that we have a J2 peak. Notice this is way above 200, so it's definitely the carbonyl. And we don't see any, or if it is there, it's so small we can't see it, that J three peak for the fluorine carbon couple. It'd probably be calculated to be just under one ppm. Uh, those hydrogens are not equivalent because of the fluorine. In this one up here, yes, these, these hydrogens are equivalent to each other because they're on a carbon with a fluorine on it. And these are not the same as these because the fluorine is not directly bonded to that carbon. Sorry, I missed the chat there. Okay, so that makes fluorine actually really, really useful probe, okay? You can look at the fluorine directly itself and see where its electronic structure is. Is it sp2, is it sp3, et cetera? You can then do a non-decoupled experiment in hydrogen and look for one, two bond and three bond and four bond couplings. And then in carbon, you can actually do the one bond and two bond couplings as well. And again- I have a question. Yes. So if there is two fluorine instead of one fluorine, how, how will be the splitting? Great question. I was just asking, gonna mention that. In this case here, the N is the number of fluorines because the one is, because we're doing carbon NMR, the one is always the NMR that we're doing. Like it's either proton or it's either the proton, the carbon or the fluorine. And the N is the nuclei that is doing the splitting. So in this case, we only have one nuclei. So our N is one, so we get doublets. If we had two fluorines here, then it would be split into a triplet, okay? Because again, it's, it's, they're equivalent to each other. In, in fluorine NMR, we get one signal, but in the fluorine carbon coupled with the, uh, the fluorine carbon coupling, we would get a triple. Very great question. I was actually just giving you that, that's great. Okay, and hang on. I see cat fur on my nose, I gotta get off. There we go, thank you. All right. So, so that's a really useful one. And so we've got really those three are probably the number, nitrogen's not as useful because of the lower uh, uh, natural abundance, but the fluorine, the carbon and the proton are great nuclei for doing all of your NMR studies if at all possible. 
Now, one of the other uh, actually nuclei I'm not talking about here, but I've also run it is tin uh, 129 actually has a great three half spin and it's got a big shift range and we can see that a lot. But the next nuclei I wanna talk about is silicon, okay? Now, one of the reasons we talk about silicon, one of the isotopes is uh, silicon 29. Uh, it's a minor isotope, but it's greater than carbon. It's about 5%. It has a half spin. And that makes it really interesting because it does actually couple to protons and carbon because of the half spin and that we, we can see it. Not only that, silicon is used as our standard for carbon and proton atom on, uh, right? It's TMS is used as our standard for carbon and proton NMR. Well, it turns out TMS is also used as our standard for silicon NMR as well, okay? So let's look into uh, number one shifts of just silicon NMR, and then we'll look at the coupling systems as well. So, <laughs> Silicon 19 NMR, what we'll see here is that uh, TMS is what we call the standard. It should be right around zero ppm in silicon NMR, okay? If we're, this is actually uh, the, the spectrum for silicon. And we notice that we have, these are things called spinning sidebands, okay? So technically it is a coupling with carbon 13, but because of the low abundance of carbon-13, they don't actually do full signals. They have these little bands that are called spinning side bands right here. And that has everything to do with the silicon coupling with the low amount of the carbon-13, okay? So we do actually see it. It's a fairly large coupling. It's about 50 hertz, which equates to about 0.5 ppm. Okay. So, when we do that, actually, we have some other issues. Most of the bores, most of the uh, bores that go through the NMRs have a piece of glass in them. And a lot of times it's a borosilicate glass, okay? Whenever you have the borosilicate glass, you have a problem where it interferes with boron and it interferes with the silicon NMR, okay? So I believe our NMR was actually specially done with the quartz glass it's because uh, Dr. Hudnall does a lot of, of uh, boron NMR and, and Dr. Peaks used to do a lot of boron NMR. So we actually have a special one that actually minimizes the amount of boron, there, but it still uses quartz. And so we have this little broad peak that we see, and it's a broad peak because if you think of glass, it's a silicon oxygen polymer that's kind of bonded in a bunch of different ways. And so it gives this broad peak at around negative um, 110, but it's easy to get rid of. What you do is you just take your blank solvent, run it, and then you save that spectrum, and then you actually run your sample, run it, and then you subtract the two samples, and it takes away the, um, the quartz in the, in the background signal. And so we actually can, uh, it's very easy to do that. We used to do that with a boron too, but you know, it, it's not as easy as just getting a non-boronated in class system. Okay, so like I said before, any, Spin active material can do coupling. So in the case of our uh, silicon here, we can actually look at the one bond uh, coupling here for silicon to hydrogen is actually a very broad range. It's uh, 366 in this particular case. And now note, this is a silane. This is an H uh, bonded directly to a silicon. These tend to be fairly reactive to air. And so we don't, we don't wanna like use these for um, uh, a lot of samples here but they are a lot of the room temperature cured silicon, silicones uh, use this kind of chemistry. They'll use a silane and a platinum catalyst and an alkene. And so you can watch, the, watch this coupling just diminish to zero because, as the thing cures because the hydrogens on that silicon go away and they turn into silicon carbon bonds. So then you get a shift and a removal of extra peaks from the system. Okay. So in addition to uh, bonding to that hydrogen, if we look at how silicon is, appears in our hydrogen NMR. So this is now, we're doing proton NMR on this same silane. 
And when we do proton NMR on the same sign line, we number one see it very shifted high because it's the hydrogens on methyl groups bonded to silicon that are down at zero ppm. That's the TMS is way down there, okay? Having a hydrogen bonded directly to silicon, of sil silicon is a lot more electronegative and therefore it shifts it way up here. So we get, you know, the peak a little above six, between six and uh, 6.2 right here. But we see again, those spinning sidebands, okay? So they are these right here. And again, we don't get that full split pattern because our abundance of the silicon 19 is only 5%, okay? And notice these peaks are a little bit more intense than the peaks that we got for the carbon-13 coupling, because the carbon-13 is only 1%. These are a little bit bigger than that, but this is the actual silicon splitting that proton in our proton NMR. Okay. And again, these are most of the time called spinning sidebands. And if you did do a true integration across the entire thing, you would get to your full one proton. What is the reason for checking the proton NMR? Oh, uh, well, because uh, proton NMR you usually do first and look for, you can actually see that you have, number one, your silane. Uh, you can see that you have three chlorines and you haven't contaminated it with a silicon oxygen bond. So let's say, you know, or so you, at, you would actually, if you were trying to make this silane, you would actually do a proton NMR to see that it was there and see that it hadn't reacted with solvent or water. Because if it reacts with, um, if it reacts with stuff like uh, water, you're gonna start to see uh, silanols and all sorts of other materials. And you can see those in proton NMR really easily. It's also faster to do proton NMR because the, uh, the, the, um, the delay time is very low and the uh, natural abundance is very high. So it would be common to do, do your proton NMR first, then your silicon NMR afterwards. Okay, does that answer your question? So in addition to coupling with hydrogen, it also couples with carbon. And it's a little different when you couple with carbon because it's a much lower concentration. Obviously, you don't see it very often, but you know, you have 1% you know, carbon 13, you have 5% silicon 29, and so it's really not that uh, typical to see. Now, what we can see though, is the coupling between silicon 19 and hydrogen, okay? And we can see those two bond couplings. And uh, in this case, we have a two bond coupling because in our, let's go right here. In our TMS, we have silicon, carbon, hydrogen and right here. And so we have another methyl group here, another methyl group here, and another methyl group here, okay? Because of the high abundance of hydrogen, that silicon hydrogen bonding we see in the TMS actually splits it again. And again, following the N plus one rule, the one is always the nuclei we're actually doing. So this is actually silicon NMR, this is the silicon NMR here. And the protons are a two bond coupling. That two bond coupling is approximately six Hertz, but we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So 12 plus one gives us a tridecaplet, 13 peaks, gives us 13 peaks, but because of the uh, abundance and the nice clean splitting here, we actually can see all 13 peaks. One, two, three, four, five, six. And yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Now we can't quite see the 13th one. But it actually is split into 13 peaks. And it follows our, um, Pascal's triangle at concentration as well. So again, the N is the number of uh, two or three bond 
nuclei that are splitting the nuclei we're actually scanning for. So we're scanning for silicon. And so these are the hydrogens that are splitting the silicon signal. All right, so I said before we can actually see a uh, silicon carbon split, although we don't really see it very much because it is um, such a low concentration, we really don't see it very much. So in this case here, we're actually looking at a two bond couple between the silicon and the hydrogen. And notice that it shows up as one peak here. If we had it spread out, it would actually be that total of those 13 peaks under here. But then the hydrogen is also splitting that carbon 13. And that carbon 13 is being split into this, giving us the appearance of spinning side bands, but it's the hydrogens that are splitting the carbon itself. And so we'll see these satellite uh, bands or spinning side bands commonly there. And it's not anything to worry about. We just need to recognize that if they're equal hertz away from this, that they're probably sending sign bands and not a unique signal. So you don't want to count it as a unique signal. If it's the same uh, PPM away from the central peak, you might have these satellite bands. All right, so the ranges actually shift really, really widely. Uh, negative 400 to plus 1,000 here. And it depends on what's attached to it, right? So our TMS here is the one in the middle here. Um, when we go to silane, so those have hydrogens on it. Uh, these have oxygens on it. And these have, you know, uh, tetrachlorosilane and stuff like that would be in this lower range. And then we have our silicons bonded to carbons right here in the middle. And then silicons bonded to metals are going to be higher. So that we have that, it's, it's a little wider than the 600 ppm range it shows, but most of them fall in this particular range. All right, so questions about silicon NMR? Uh, this is really great when you have like a, a TMS group as a protecting group, you just want to make sure it's there. Uh, if you have multiple TMSs, you can actually tell the difference between one on a primary and a secondary carbon because of shift. So you can't actually tell the difference. Um, but, you know, it, it all depends on your research as to how important you're doing your silicon NMR is. All right. Um, let's see. Phosphorus NMR. Uh, phosphorus 31. Uh, it's got a significant amount of that isotope. It makes it easy to do. But again, it does, it does require decoupling. If you do not decouple it with hydrogen because of the high concentration, you will see it, okay? So in phosphorus, this is really great for when you have uh, uh, phosphate esters, biological materials, uh, phospholipids. Uh, a lot of pesticides actually have phosphorus-based systems in them, so they do a lot of phosphorus in them all related to that. And in addition to that, the other thing that you use phosphorus for is ligands in organometallic compounds, okay? And when you bind these as ligands in organometallic compounds, you see really big shift differences between having it bound to a, uh, a plus two metal versus plus three metal. You'll see a significant difference from that. And that's where phosphorus NMR comes in really handy, especially when you're doing uh, uh, catalytic, uh, you know, uh, homogeneous catalytic work where you have these phosphorus ligands. Okay. Um, because of the um, uh, length of decay time on this, our integration is inaccurate. Just like with carbon, you have to do a really long relaxation time to make sure you get it. The relaxation time is long enough in phosphorus to not get great. Uh, 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 integration, but you do the shifts show up really well. And if you do a good decoupling experiment, you get nice clean peaks. Okay. But you can get them if you do an inverse gated experiment. And I don't know if our machine does that. It should be able to, but I, I'm not sure. Okay, so in our uh, carbon NMR, I'm sorry, in our phosphorus NMR, we get nice clean peaks. And we also have uh, one carb one bond, two bond, and three bond couplings with hydrogen. 
because of the amount of hydrogen in there, it just happens to be very, very good. One bond couplings are really huge, so six to 700 hertz. Two bond couplings are a little bit smaller. And by the time we get to three bonds or four bonds, it gets really diminished, okay? Just like we, but it's a slightly, it's similar to that of fluorine in the fact that we have this really big one bond coupling and then it kind of tapers off after that. Okay. And you can actually see it with fluorine. If you have fluorine on your phosphorus and you haven't uh, pulsed to make sure your fluorine doesn't relax, then you get to see it. And again, with that system, you will see that uh, ethyl phosphite, you get both the one bond and three bond coupling with hydrogen in this system. Now notice that these two peaks are the same phosphorus. Okay, they are a phosphorus with a hydrogen directly on it. And so these two peaks are actually being split by okay, uh, diethyl phosphite right here. So this hydrogen right here is doing the initial split of the peak. And then we have a total of four hydrogens that are there giving us these pentets. Okay, so here again, our N plus one rule works. We're doing phosphorus NMR. We have one hydrogen here. It splits at once with a coupling constant of almost 700 Hertz. Okay, so you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, this is um, a huge split here. Those have to be two different phosphorus. No, it's the same phosphorus being split by a single hydrogen. Okay, and then these multiplets are because of the one, two, three bond coupling constant to the total of four hydrogens on these ethyl groups. So then we have CH3s at the end here. Okay. So we see a great application of the one N, uh, uh, N plus one rule here, but the coupling constants are dramatically bigger than anything we've dealt with up to now. Okay, so in your uh, uh, phosphorus NMR, don't get fooled by thinking you have two different phosphoruses here. If you have a nitrogen, if you have a halogen, fluorine, or, uh, or hydrogen directly bonded to your phosphorus, you're going to see this same huge shift. Okay, so um, let's see. So, okay, go ahead. So I just want to make sure that uh, the n plus one is two over here. So in this case here, let me erase that part. Uh, for our first coupling constant, this this J of one bond right here, we have one of the N and one of the phosphorus, so that should be two. So okay. that's why we have two peaks. This is one. Yes, that's why we are getting two peaks, and the uh, the multiplet splitting is because of the Methyl hydrogen? It's that the, yeah, because these are ethyl groups over here. We have one bond, two bond, three bonds to these hydrogens. Okay. Total of four hydrogens on these two uh, carbons here. So that gives our N is now four plus our phosphorus gives us five. So these are pentets. Okay. Yes. Yes. And notice it's a much smaller coupling constant. This is much more traditional of what we'd like to see in like a proton NMR. The three bond coupling constants are, you know, five, 10 Hertz. And so this is more consistent with what we'd see in a proton NMR. But this huge split here is what we see in our fluorine and or phosphorus. Okay, so that's because uh, Hydrogen and fluorine can split phosphorus. Well, phosphorus can actually go back and split hydrogen as well. So if we look at the proton NMR and we look at a three bond split for that on that same compound here, let me draw the compound again. Uh, let's see, phosphorus, O, CH2, CH2, three. O, CH2, CH3, hydrogen here. Okay, so 
we're looking at the proton NMR. So we have a total of one, two, three signals available to us. Okay. And we think that this one is probably that one. This one's probably that one. Then this hydrogen has to be these shifted way up here. Okay. So if we were just looking at shift based on what they're bound to, that's where we're going to assign these peaks, right? Because this is the methylene next to an oxygen. This is the furthest away. And then we have these two peaks up here. Are those two different hydrogens? No. If we look at it, that we have a single bond coupling constant split of 600 hertz, 691 hertz. So these two would actually integrate into one proton NMR, one proton. These would integrate to four and these would integrate to six. But notice these here, now we have a one, two, three uh, bond shift. The coupling constants decrease to approximately nine. nine. And so we see this multiplet right here. It's technically a, um, you know, the hydrogen is being split here. So it's a quartet for the hydrogen split but then it's also a split one more time because of the phosphorus. And so we end up with a quartet laid on top of a quartet and that's why we have this multiple. So the first quartet is from the hydrogen splitting and then we split it one more time with the phosphorus. So that'd be a crazy Pascal triangle to draw that out. But again, by doing integration, you can prove to yourself that these two are actually the same hydrogen. They just have a huge couple of So in phosphorus, uh, in this spectrum, so the hydrogen is coupling with its hydrogen as well as phosphorus. Okay. Um, repeat that, please. So the hydrogen in this, the NMR hydrogen, hydrogen is coupling with its, the other hydrogen, and also with the proton, uh, phosphorus. Correct, correct. So if we looked at this one, we just have a triplet because it's so far away, we only see the, uh, the we have the hydrogen-hydrogen coupling giving us a triplet here. We have our hydrogen-hydrogen coupling giving us a quartet here. And this is an isolated hydrogen. It should give us a single peak, okay? So that's just the hydrogen coupling hydrogen. Now, when we add the phosphorus coupling, we get a huge coupling constant because it's a J1. And then this is a three, a J3, which is gonna give us a little bit shorter. It, it's gonna give us smaller one. But it's so far away from these, this one doesn't see a coupling constant. So we're only splitting these two peaks with the phosphorus, okay? Okay, and if we have a fluorine and we are checking proton and MR with phosphorus, so do, do we have to decouple the fluorine? Um, you would either, yeah, or you have to account for it splitting. It's gonna have a different coupling constant. So what you might end up with is literally four little peaks like this, if you had a fluorine on here too, that would be very hard. <laughs> Uh, you'd have to, you probably would want to do a proton decoupled experiment with, and then let the fluorine split and then do a fluorine decoupled experiment and let the proton split. Okay. Uh, but that would be, that would be a hard one to analyze. You know? But it, it's possible. It's, it's not, a, and then the fluorine NMR would show you a very clear attachment to the phosphorus. The proton NMR is just going to be a little bit split more. Hmm, I wonder. That's probably in the literature somewhere. I just don't know. I've just never seen it. Mm -hmm. you, you just mentioned that it coupled with fluorine. That's why I, I'm, we are going to see or not. <laughs> yes, you will see it. It will, it, any, especially any nuclei that has a high abundance, you will always see that coupling unless you run a decoupling experiment. And with the computer systems nowadays, you might just have to click decouple or not decouple. Oh, okay. But that might not be a button yet. Okay. So our phosphorus NMR ranges, you know, pretty big. Also, uh, the more um, the the actual uh, uh, phosphorus uh, thirty one standard is phosphoric acid, and so that's why it's right here in the middle. Okay. And so it's a phosphorus of four oxygens around it, and a, it's got five bonds to oxygen. So that's gives us the. Phosphenes are phosphoruses with hydrogens on them, and so they're shifted down. 
Uh, and then as we add halogens, it shifts them up. And by changing the nature of the bond with oxygen, you can shift it back and forth. So by taking away a couple of bonds to oxygen and adding the hydrogens, they'll shift in this direction. Taking away a couple of bonds to oxygen and adding uh, halogens, you'll shift it the other. Okay. Okay, and so here's a good example of doing a decoupled versus non-decoupled experiment to help clarify, okay? So in this case here, we have our phosphorus right here on this, you know, it's phospholipid, or I guess it's a, it's not a phospholipid, it's a, uh, I don't know, protein fragment? Uh, I'm not a biochemist, sorry. Okay, so we have our, let's draw attention to our phosphorus first. We're gonna circle that. In blue. So our phosphorus here is going to be splitting our proton and okay. But we have we don't have a direct single bond coupling, so we don't have to worry about the huge, uh, you know, 200 hertz ones. But we do have something that's three bonds away. Okay. So in this case here, we have a this A1 right here has a three bond coupling constant. This B1 has a four bond coupling constant right here. Oh, that's, yeah, that's it. A four bond coupling constant, which is really, really small. This C has a three bond coupling constant, but notice it has a different shift because this C is bonded to an oxygen, a nitrogen is on the next atom and then a hydrogen is over here. So that's significantly different than this one here. It's actually got a significant shift from that. And then E is way over here and has zero phosphorus coupling. It's too far over. That's, that's uh, five bonds over. But we can see the phosphorus, the single phosphorus doing a J1, and let's do it again. Okay. Uh, J1 through uh, four. So a phosphorus to hydrogen couple through four bonds. Now, why do we see it through four bonds? Okay, our first bond is over 200 hertz and we're just like halving it each time. That's the only way we can see it over that many bonds. If we were looking at proton-proton coupling, we technically can do a four hertz one, but it's gonna be, I'm sorry, a four bond over, but it's gonna be less than one hertz. We'll never see it, okay? So that's the advantage of having these things with big coupling constants is you can see further and further down the chain. So this is the phosphorus coupling to hydrogen. And now this is the hydrogen coupling to phosphorus. Okay, so this is the back way. This is doing the phosphorus NMR and then doing, uh, seeing where the hydrogen couples to it. And we get to see that if we do a decouple experiment, it goes down to one phosphorus because there's nothing else nearby that splits it. The primary isotope of oxygen is 16, which has a spin of zero so it doesn't split. Okay. So when we go over, we can start to see a little bit of splitting because of our proximity to our protons at A and C. Okay, so that's gonna give us our three bond splitting. Okay, and so technically those are different protons because they have different places, but their coupling constant must be pretty close because we only see our first uh, triplet, because we have two hydrogens here, plus the phosphorus giving us our triplet. And then what we'll see is we can get our fourth uh, bond over, get to this uh, one, two, three. There's, there's no fourth hydrogen bond. Oh, just the idea of having a hydrogen over there broadens it out as well. So ideally, we would actually just see two triplets here, one for A and one for C, but their coupling constants are probably close enough, they're overlapping and just broadening out our lines. Okay. So this is phosphorus splitting hydrogen, and this is hydrogen splitting phosphorus.
And that is the last of the nuclei I want to go. What are we running on time? A little early, but okay. Questions. Okay. Net result is look for high concentrations of the natural abundance of an odd massed element. And chances are you can do NMR. Okay. Every spin active element, if you have a high concentration of it, you will have uh, nuclei, nuclei splitting. Uh, and you, the, the, the one bond splittings are always in the two bonds that are bigger than the three bonds. So you're going to see that those are, uh, you know, that one bond uh, coupling constants are going to be huge. You're going to get a lot of information from those in all of these different nuclei. Okay. So is it that we don't see oxygen 17 because it has such a low abundance? I might have missed the abundance on that. Oh, uh, 17. Well, it also has a quadrupole. Uh, so in the, the oxygen is not as useful because it has a quadrupole. Okay, I missed that. Thank you. So, um, so it's not a very big one. And Part of it comes, it, it's negative, which means what it's going to do is it's going to be, uh, so basically your nucleus is not spherical. It's going to be, the main axis is going to be off of the magnetic field. And that's going to give you a, a broader signal because not everything's going to relax in the same amount of time because now you're, you know, you're having to you know, orient the thing differently. All right, but good question. All right, so again, these are posted on Canvas if you want to review them. Uh, and so we'll probably incorporate a little bit of this into uh, maybe looking at measuring the coupling constants for those, especially the J1s. The J1s are the more fun to measure on the activity on Thursday. The more activities we do, the more it boosts our grade because we don't have to rely on tests as much. The activity will be about uh, these these other nuclei, or it will be about. <clears throat> well, uh, it's going to be one problem on two D NMR, yeah. and then one with uh, non one with multi nuclei splitting each other. Okay, so it'll just be the two problems, just like last time. And it looked like it took you the whole time to do it. I mean, you guys were still there when I was leaving, so. But I'll, I'll be grading those soon, and so I'll, I'll have an answer. But again, the key is already up if you want to take a look. Okay. I was kind of curious about the last, um, the last activity. I noticed after our group split up that the het core scale for carbon seemed to be a little bit off. I don't know if anyone else saw that. Let me. See that? For which one, uh, problem one or problem two? Uh, problem two. Okay, let me pull up the activity here and share my screen. All right, so this is, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. All right, so this is number one. And this is number two. So we have from 70 to 20 is where the three carbons are there. And that was the, so 70 here and 20 there. Sorry, I meant the, um, the hydrogen NMR. Um, just the placement of the peaks, because I think we had a peak, I might've drawn it wrong, but it seemed a little off to me because we had a peak that was at like three point. Okay. Because the one at three here um, is the one that exchanges with that. So it has to be the alcohol. And we can actually. Uh... Um, three point something and like. Actually, actually uh, the uh, can you read the problem? The, uh, the shift you have mentioned in the problem is a little different than the proton NMR. So she's referring, I think, so to the, that, the 3.28, 3.28, and the proton number that you have given. 
Right. That's, she wants that's three point three is right here. So that's just below three. If you remember, you you take the in the middle of the split here. So it's just below the three point four. I mean, three point three here. This is three. Let me get a. Yeah, and then there's another peak at 2.98. And when you look at the het core, I think they're shifted a little a uh, bit lower on the scale. Okay, so this is just below three. This is just below 3.3. Uh, this is, oh yeah, this, yeah, this scale is wrong. But they drew the lines for you. And so the position, the, you're right, that, that is, this is shifted off. The three should be right here. Yes, you are correct. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I was doing the problem right and understanding it. So it was just slightly shifted. This should be your three point, and this should be three point three. But the relative position is is just fine because what you'll see is that uh, it's going to give you a signal there, um, and then a signal here, and a signal there. And nothing's going to correlate to the to the hydrogen on the oxygen here. So, and this is going to correlate to the methyl groups, which are lowest. This is going to correlate to the one that's split. And wait, hold on. Let me double check the structure. The, yeah, these two are going to be. Let's see. Those two are going to be these two. So, yeah. So those are going to be, yeah. So it should look something like that if I remove that. So those should be, because this one shouldn't have anything correlating to it because that's the, uh, the hydrogen on the oxygen. And so it doesn't correlate to any of them. And then for here, we'd probably get what we do our diagonal first. We get an X here, an X here, an X here, and an X here. And we'd have nothing correlating to this one on any of these because that's the one with the oxygen on it. We would have nothing correlating, to, wait, hold on, uh, where's the structure? This one should only correlate to one, two, three. Oh, it should correlate to both. So there should be a peak. Not there, um, not there, there and there and there, but not here and here. And I'm only doing one half. Because this one is the center line here. So, oops, it doesn't do that. And so this is the, the two protons that are next to that, so one, two, three. Yeah, so these are going to be correlated. And then these are going to be correlated to the, the threes and the twos. And yeah, so it's going to look something like that. But yes, this is, this is off. This is off by uh, about 0.3 ppm. And then I think, let me double check that. Here's the key. Uh, unambiguous assignment is that three is the higher one, four is the lower one. Four is the one that is closest to this number five, three is there. Now you could just say, well, shift maybe. So this, these are the two ambiguous peaks in this particular one here. And again, those are the same two ambiguous peaks. These other peaks up here are obvious. This is obviously the carbonyl. This is obviously the one next to the oxygen because of shift. This is obviously the one next to the carbonyl because of shift. It's only these two that are ambiguous. So those from here, you just say, uh, you can make a 50-50 guess. That's why we actually go to this. And from here, we get a very clear picture because the five and the four are correlated and the three and the two are correlated that that gives you a definite assignment for that. And it's supplemented when we do it here because notice this three is associated with this carbon, this four is associated with that carbon. So we actually unambiguously identified carbon three and carbon four and carbon and hydrogen three and hydrogen four. 
And notice they're swapped. Three is higher, four is lower on the proton MR, but four is higher and three is lower on the carbon MR, which gives us our net result of, and these are just approximate. So I have a question about the second one. Uh -huh. That uh, OH, hydrogen of the OH is not coupling, but we are not sure about, uh, are they showing up in this, the cozy one or not? Um, on this one right here, they're not showing up where? Cozy. Oh, uh, they show up. They just don't have any correlation. They're, uh, the, most of the time, especially when you're using a solvent like chloroform, the exchange is so quick that it, there is zero coupling through an oxygen. And so that's why this proton doesn't couple with anything except itself because this is the proton on the oxygen. This, so this is the oxygen, the OH protons here. And it's, it's technically three bonds away from another hydrogen. However, you don't split through um, uh, the oxygen if it exchanges quickly. If this was done in DMSO and you actually saw that uh, oxygen split into a triplet because of these two hydrogens, then you would see correlation. You would oh. only see correlation if you saw these hydrogens, these number two hydrogens, these ones way up here, if they were split by this oxygen. Okay, you won't see it otherwise because here we're, we're, we're definitely showing we do not have a proton proton coupling through this oxygen in this condition. Therefore, you will not see it in the cozy either. Okay. Okay. Yeah, question. that was the confusing question with among us. <laughs> yeah, and, and the, the easy way to do it is like, if we did this entire experiment in DMSO, you would not have a doublet here. You would now yeah. have a, a doublet of double. Yes. Because this would split it split one way and, and split yeah. it the other. And this would split it one way and this would split it the other way. So we would have two doublets. And if it had two doublets, you would also have a triplet here for your exchanges with OH then you would see it in the cozy. Okay. 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 I wasn't trying to be tricky. I, that's why I said exchanges so that you wouldn't think it was coupling through. Uh, chapter four was due last Friday. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I sent it out an email. I thought it was due on Friday. I also, yeah. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, any other questions? We're right at 2, 1220, so that's right at the end of class here. Okay, uh, come on down, ready on Thursday for an activity. Yeah, just go ahead and turn it in uh, if you haven't turned it in already. I haven't downloaded those yet, so I'll download those uh, tomorrow. All right, I'm going to stop recording.